we know that in, our, in the context of our uh, everyday lives, there are too many choices to make. How, do you, how many do you find that? So many choices. Yeah? And uh, what do we do with our lives? How do we determine the will of God? And um, I've heard it said, and I really hold on to this, it says that the call of God upon your life is where your greatest passion meets and intersects with the world's greatest need. Okay? Your greatest passion intersects with the world's greatest need. And so for us, when we look at what our lives are about and what we're called to do, uh, we need to take a perspective of this world that a Christian can comfortably hold on to. And that's not a, a worldly perspective, it's a heavenly perspective. All of the things that we do and all the things that we're called to do are put in the context of eternity. When the world is looking at what it is that their will for their life is, they're looking at us as to how much of this world can I take charge of or responsibility for because I have this one life and uh, it's over very quickly, so therefore how do I leave my mark? You know, the old story about, you know, you look at a, somebody's date of birth and then their day of departure, their date of death, what do you do with your dash in the middle? You know, that's, that's the record of your life. But for us as Christians, as followers of, of Christ, uh, the will of God will be determined by God and it's up to us to continue to try to walk in that. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to have a look at some verses out of Romans and we're going to dissect those. And then we're going to look at a character out of the Old Testament who I think really exemplifies uh, discerning the will of God. And then we're going to look at some practical steps about how we can discern the will of God ourselves. So I trust that you're up for a good ride. We're going to firstly look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. Familiar verses, I suspect, but uh, we'll go through this uh, piece by piece, and then we will uh, move into this Old Testament character. Romans 12, 1 to 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as, living, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So we're going to go through this, but the first thing I want to say is that God wants to renew your mind. It's the renewing of your mind, not the removal of your mind. Okay, because uh, when, when I talk to some people about understanding the will of God, they just say, oh, look, all I have to do is be in God's presence and, and God will guide me and lead me. And I'm like, yeah, well, that sounds more like the removal of your mind than the renewal of your mind. And, and so when I, and I ask other people, what is it that God will have you do? Well, he's just going to lead me, open doors, shut doors, open doors, shut doors. Again, that's the removal of your mind, not the renewal of your mind. You, am I with you with me on this? You know, we can be so spiritually minded that we're of no earthly good. God wants us to understand his good and pleasing will, and we're going to have a look at that in a moment. But the first thing uh, that we need to understand is that transformation is the name of the game. Okay, so we're being asked to be transformed. Uh, that, that, uh, there's this uh, series of um, cartoons and uh, movies called Transformers. Okay, um, my son was right into it when he was in his teenage years, and so I managed to get along to a few movies and watch Optimus Prime and uh, Strong Arm and Bumblebee all be translated from these flash cars into these monsters that were uh, defending good rather than evil. Uh, but what we saw there is this transformation take place of a car that would turn into a, into a fighting machine and defend, defend goodness. And, and for us as Christians, we have to believe that transformation is possible. We have to hold on to stories that are in the scriptures like the Apostle Paul, who was Saul, was the persecutor of the church, then became the defender of the faith. We have to hold on to stories where we see the little shepherd boy like David go from being a humble shepherd to a great king. All of these stories talk about transformation. And I think one of the challenges that we face in New Zealand is that as New Zealanders we have this all shucks mentality. It's the all shucks mentality is like, well, you know, uh, who am I, you know, that God would use me or choose me? Uh, and it's sort of this sort of kickback and don't expect too much from God to expect too much from you, for you, for you or from you. And I think it's really important that we break that mindset because otherwise we just simply hold back on what God would use us for. Now, it's a journey and we can't get too far ahead of ourselves. 
you know, we don't want to uh, take ourselves too seriously and God not so seriously. We can't get ahead of ourselves. But what is possible? Seriously, what is possible? And I know for myself and my own life, I turn around these days and I laugh. I laugh with God and I laugh at God at some of the things that I find myself doing where 20 years ago I could never have dreamed that God would ever put me in places like I find myself. And uh, it is still, it's a little bit like a cosmic joke. I've got a friend of mine who's in ministry and we laugh about it. We say, this is a cosmic joke where God takes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Okay, and we sort of high five each other and say, you know, let's just hang in there being foolish for God. You know? Just um, late last year is the last time that myself and other church leaders from around the country, uh, we, I'm the head of the Baptist Union, Baptist denomination, and we go in and uh, meet with Prime Minister John Key and, and Bill English, and we sit down and we talk about the nation and the challenges that are being faced and how the church can help and what the government could do more of or less of. And I'm sitting there thinking... This is so funny. This is, this is really hilarious. At one level, it's like God just takes an everyday guy out of Tapuna School, went through boys' college, played rugby, did a bit of, bit of learning along the way, and here we are in this position where God does what only God will do. And so for me, it's like, come on. We, we, we need to accept the fact that God can take anybody from any background, and we're going to have a look at an Old Testament character soon who had just this experience. And we can see ourselves as people who are transformed. Okay, the Transformers illustration straight out of, of the movies is exactly what I'm describing. Who knows what God will do with you? And it doesn't matter what age you are. The good thing about Scripture is it tells us that Moses, uh, in his 80s, was transformed into a powerful statesman. Okay, and it tells, tells us about young, young people like the prophet Samuel, who was called when he was a little boy. So it doesn't matter where you are. God is in the process of transformation. And I just really need you to hear that tonight. But Romans tells us that, uh, what Paul tells us through Romans, that we should should offer our bodies. Okay? And this is a really essential part of it. We can't just offer half of our body or a portion of our body. You know, so, so many people will sort of offer God a hand. You know, here you go. Here, God, here's a hand. With this hand, I can give somebody a hand out. You know, I've got a bit of spare change of the hand out, or I can give them a hand up. Okay? Is that enough, God? Is that all you want? Just a hand? You know, I could offer a foot because I could kick a few people, you know, or I could offer my tongue and tell them a few things they need to know. Well, separately, these things don't help, but when we offer our whole bodies, our foot, a hand, and our mouth, and our intelligence with a transformed and renewed mind can actually be helpful to God. But we can't sit on the fringes just offering a hand out or a hand up or just a little bit of advice. So many people try to offer a little piece of their own mind when they haven't got much to spare. And so we have to make sure that we're offering our whole self. Otherwise, we're simply uh, walking in some, at some level of hypocrisy. We talk about Jesus being Lord of all, but he's really only Lord of my hand. You know, I might shake a few people on Sunday, shake their hands, give them a hand out or a hand up. He wants all of us. And, uh, and that's why... The term living sacrifice is the next thing that we pick up in this, in this little, uh, th- these few sentences of Paul's. And a living sacrifice, this imagery comes straight out of the Old Testament. Because to put yourself in the right position with God, in the Old Testament days, you had to take an animal and you'd lay your hands on it and you'd confess your sins. So you'd take a sheep or a dove, okay? or a goat, and you'd lay your hands upon it, and you'd confess your sins, and you could be there for a fair while. And then the animal was taken by the priest and slaughtered. So that animal became a sacrifice for your sin. And that's, that's why Christ is referred to as the Passover lamb. He took our sins upon himself, and he was sacrificed. Okay, So we got this imagery of, of, of sacrifice, we got this imagery of death, and yet we are told that we're not to be dead sacrifices, we're to be living sacrifices, which is actually harder because it means that we have to die daily. Okay? We have to die daily. And uh, dying to self is a real challenge, isn't it? Because every day we will often face the same old problems. How many of you have seen the movie Groundhog Day? You know, the guy gets to relive the same life, the same day, again and again and again, until finally he gets it right, 
and then he can move on from there. Well, there's a sense in which for us, when we are being living sacrifices, God continues to refine us and define us for his purpose. And so to be a living sacrifice means that you come to God, you lay yourself down on the altar and you say, God, do whatever you need to do in me so that you can do through me what you aim to do so that your perfect will might be outworked. The only problem with this, and you've heard me say it before, is that as living sacrifices, we crawl off the altar. <laughs> you know, it's like God saying, yeah, I want to fix you. Where have you gone? Okay, last week you offered your life to me, but there I can see you crawling away. Okay, living sacrifices. We need to stay there so that God can do his, do his work and his, have his way and fulfill his purpose in our life. Um, one of the differences between Christianity and Islam is that when somebody is called to sacrifice, we're called to be a living sacrifice. In Islam, sadly, in today's society, we see dead sacrifices, people martyring themselves for the cause on the basis that they feel that they're pleasing their God. Well, there's just an incredible distinction between those two forms of sacrifice. And I must say, I reckon it's be easier to blow yourself up than to die daily for the sake of the gospel and to give up and give over in humility your life so that you will be a sacrifice and a servant in the process. Does that make sense? Yeah. The other thing that uh, we're told by Paul is that we can be uh, called to be holy and pleasing. To be sacrificial is to be holy because you're called to give up and to give over the things of the world that you might separate yourself for God. You are set apart for God, and that is your sacrifice. Okay, it's not, uh, it's not miserableness. Okay, we're not called to be sad and self effacing. We're called to be sacrificial and joyful. Okay, it's not like you're walking around going, Oh, I've given this up for Jesus. It's such a, it's a praise the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. You know, I just wish Jesus would hurry up and return. To be a living sacrifice and to be holy means that we are separated for God from the world. But it's the for God that attracts us. It's the for God that calls us forward. It's the for God that excites us. It's the for God that gets us out of bed in the morning because we're going to find God doing stuff in and through our lives that totally excites us. We're not sitting around and getting up every day and going, oh, I'm so sad that I gave up all that stuff for Jesus. Well, you haven't really because you're still living there wanting it and you're feeling sad for yourself. But what we're told here is that we can be holy and pleasing to God. Do you realize that? That as we give up and over our lives, we please God. We're like an aroma to Him. We are a sweet smell to His nostrils of a life being outworked and outlived. God actually takes pleasure in our decisions. God takes pleasure in our actions. And that just should excite us because it tells us that God is personally interested in the decisions we make. When we're making sacrifices, yes. When we're making decisions for him, yes. And sometimes at a price, sometimes not. But we are pleasing the creator. And I, I, just, I just love that, that image. To think that humble little old us could actually put a smile on the face of God. That, to me, is a, a beautiful picture that as we give up and give it over, God starts to take joy in whom we are. And this, we're told, is our true and proper worship. It's true and proper worship. Now, we're going to... Uh, we've already sung songs tonight. We'll finish off with a song. And we can say, that was a fantastic time of worship tonight. And it wasn't hard to worship tonight, was it? We had some wonderful musicians led by some wonderful singers with fine voices, and, uh, and they really led us well. It was sensitively done, and, and, uh, and so it's not difficult to worship. The challenge would be in worship, to bring a sacrifice of worship, if I was leading the singing, and I was leading you with a stick with bottle tops on it, saying, let's bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. You'll be going, this is a sacrifice, all right? Yeah? Because you've got to listen to that. And even his bottle tops will be out of tune. When it actually is a sacrifice of praise, when it's actually hard work, because so often 
And I'm going to stop here on music. So often we think music and worship, the singing of songs, is all about us. You know, we go home at night and, well, how was church tonight? Oh, well, you know, the musicians were out of key, you know. Uh, I didn't like it at all. I don't like that song, you know, that Hillsong album, that latest one. Nah, it doesn't really do it for me. Well, it's not about you. We weren't praising you. We didn't have you in the corner and everybody bowing down to you and you went, oh, I didn't really like that. We're praising God, okay? And, and sometimes when it is easier to praise God, I sometimes wonder whether God thinks that that's the actual praise that he's after. There are times when things just don't go so well. Musicians have put their, their hard yards in. They've worked really hard. They've done everything they possibly can. And something just doesn't happen. Is that right, Darren? You can put these, all these efforts in. And just sometimes something just doesn't happen. You don't know what it is. You did everything the same as last week. You'd prayed the same prayers. You'd eaten the same pizza beforehand. Everything's the same and then something just doesn't go right. And, and, and people go, oh, you know, God wasn't in the house. He was in the house. He was in the house. But we pretend that he isn't because we aren't feeling as nice as we felt the week before. Because the bass guitarist has got a tune that's, uh, sorry, a, a, a string that's untuned. Yeah? That's why the worship that is pleasing to God is us bringing a living sacrifice. And as we look, as we do a study of this to find the will of God, the perfect will of God is found in perfect worship, which is found in caring for the widows, caring for the orphans. It's actually an action, not a feeling generated by good music. Okay? So don't get confused. I love worship music. I think it's fantastic. It's just great to get lost in the presence of God and he dwells the praises of his people. We love all of that. But always remember, it's never about you. It's always about him. And if I hear any complaints about the music and how it didn't do it for tonight, I warn you, I know where I can get enough bottle tops from. Okay? I know where a big stick is. And I can lead you in worship, and then I tell you what, the next week you'll think the team is brilliant. All right? I can guarantee you that. All right? Now, be warned. Be warned. Okay. Just as well I'm going away for four months, eh? Yeah. And then we're told by Paul not to conform to the pattern of this world. And I was thinking about this during the week, and I realized that, yeah, the world is full of patterns. Patterns. Things that just follow a systematic way in which people start to separate themselves from God and, and, and align themselves with the world. People might be here tonight planning to go to, away to university. There is a pattern when you go to university. You go away and you, you kiss your mother and your father, you take some of their money, you promise them that you will be good, and then you end up going to O-Week, Orientation Week, okay? And you're subjected to copious amounts of alcohol and temptation, all right? And you've got to be really strong to resist that temptation. And many fail and many don't make it through the first week. And after that, the pattern of this world is more and more alcohol, more and more boys, more and more girls, uh, more and more parties, less study, until finally you re realize that you're going to, if you don't do your study, you're going to get kicked out. Okay, you're not going to make it. So there's all of a sudden a dive into the books after about six weeks. Essays start to appear. You're managing to scrape your way through. You get to the first lot of exams. And then you go home and the mum and dad say, how are you? And you go, it's great. Are you being good? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Did you survive? Oh, oh, oh. I just ignored it. I just ignored it. There's a, there's a pattern. There's a pattern. There's a pattern when it comes to the accumulation of wealth. We're told that accumulating wealth is really, really important. Your identity is centered around it. We all know the old story, the old sign, say, sayings that say, he who dies with the most toys wins. Okay? We, we can't continue in the pattern that that worldly uh, temptation provides. Uh, there, are, there is a sexual pattern. You're told that you should be able to be sexually active pretty much whenever you want to, whenever you know how you get into the, the do now, okay? Know how do now. The sexual activity amongst, uh, amongst people today is seen as a recreational activity. You know, what do you do? Oh, I play soccer, I play rugby, I have sex. It's, it's just at that level, okay? 
It's so different to the way that God designed uh, sexual activity to happen. Okay? We are designed to be uh, in, a, in, a, in a relationship with our spouse, and there that is where uh, our sexual activity and our sexual freedom is to be expressed. What about the retirement pattern? Do you like the retirement pattern? Retirement pattern is accumulate as much money as soon as you can and then retire. If, and, and, if, and if you're fortunate enough to be able to do that, you should be able to lower your golf handicap you know, or go fishing a little bit more. Um, I don't read in the Bible anywhere about retirement. If anybody would like to show me those scriptures, um, I, I'd be really keen. What I do find is that people um, redirect their lives. They change. They go through certain changes and stages in their lives. But look, believe me, from the age of 60 onwards, these can be the best years of your life if you allow God to use them. Well, all the experience you've got, you've got a bit more freedom, a little bit more time. Um, just think of all these places around the world that could just prosper with a person who, or a couple who have been through life's experiences and they make themselves available to, uh, to be the house parents on a YWAM course, for example or to go into some uh, impoverished nation and just help people make a little difference in their lives. There are just so many ways in which you can mentor young people and be involved in their lives, teaching them how to, how to pray, how to read scripture, pass on your experiences. Why stick with the world's retirement pattern? Seriously. It's, it's, there's so much more to do, to do. And then finally, you're told that you can test and approve the perfect will of God. Test and approve. And I, I like this because it means that we have been given the ability to discern the will of God, to test and to approve. In other words, God is saying, this is what I want for you to do, and you are the one who's doing the approving. You're saying, this appears to be God's will for my life, and right now, this is my greatest desire, meeting God's greatest need, or this world's greatest need. Therefore, you can nod your head and say, I approve this. This is what God wants to do with my life. And so we find ourselves being able to discern the will of God as we take ourselves through this process of firstly surrendering ourselves, allowing God to use us and for us to give up the patterns of the world. And then we're freely available for God to use us. And there we find ourselves in the will of God. How many of you had the opportunity to hear Stephanie Christensen speak this morning? Okay, I'll just give a brief overview for those who didn't. Uh, Steph is involved uh, in missions. She lives in Beirut in Lebanon, and she's been living in this area for 20 years of her life. She explained to us how things have been happening miraculously and through her life in the last four to five months. Okay, I won't go into the details. And I was absolutely excited, as we all were, to hear about the sovereign hand of God working in, in miraculous power in and through the ministry that she's involved with. I thought, that is absolutely outstanding. And we all go, man, I'd love a bit of that action. God says, that's great. Just give me 20 years of learning Arabic, living in Syria and Lebanon, and you can have a piece of the action too. You see? There's no shortcuts in this. No shortcuts at all. But, you know, if you ask Stephanie, would she give up those 20 years uh, to not see what's happening now? Heck no. God's got her in that sweet spot where he can trust her with things that he couldn't have trusted her with 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Does it make sense? Yeah. Now, let me introduce you to a guy out of uh, Judges chapter 6. I think this guy, Gideon, is probably the greatest example of wanting to understand and know the will of God. Okay? Now, let me put you in the picture. I'm not going to read the scripture. I'm going to tell you the story. But the land of Israel was totally overrun by the Midianites. The scripture actually tells us that they were like grasshoppers running throughout the land, ravaging and taking everything. And we find our hero, Gideon, uh, taking the wheat and threshing the wheat in the wine press. Okay, So something that's normally done out in the open, here he is in the ground because you need a pit, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a trough, don't you? for the wine to be pressed so that the juice doesn't escape. So here he is in a hole, taking some wheat, getting the wheat off it, thrashing it. Okay, and you can just imagine him peeking up, looking around, thinking of any Midianites here, those little grasshoppers are going to come and flog my wheat, back to it, thrashing the wheat. And an angel appears to him. 
and says, you, Gideon, son of the most high God. Um, and he's like, who are you talking about? I am Gideon. I am from the least tribe in the whole of Israel, the tribe of Manasseh. And my own clan is the least of that tribe. So I'm the least of the least. And here I am hiding out in a hole, trying to get enough bread, uh, wheat to make bread. Okay, and an angel of the Lord turns him up and says, Mighty warrior, mighty warrior. He's like, you got the wrong address, bro. You absolutely got the wrong address. If you want a mighty warrior, just go down the road there because I am not him. Okay, and the, the Lord tests him and he says, you've been called to deliver Israel. He's like, now I know you've got the wrong address. You know, you're out to lunch, you know. I don't know where you came from. I don't know what I've been sniffing up in this, uh, in this wheat here, but you must be a victim of my imagination. Okay? So what he does is he tests him. And this is where Gideon's strength comes from. He tests the angel. And he takes this uh, wine and this bread. No, sorry, a, a piece of meat, a piece of mutton and the bread. And he puts it down there and he walks away and he says, uh, this is a sacrifice to God. And uh, you will take it, and you will, you, will, you will take it as an offering if you really are the Lord's angel. Well, with that, the angel just smokes it, you know, just whoosh, disappears. And he's like, okay, okay, this is the will of God. And so what he does that, that night, uh, because he's not a very brave little soldier at this stage, he sneaks out at night, and he climbs the highest hill, and he finds this uh, Asherah pole. Okay, so it's a place of worship to the god Baal. And so what he does is he takes his old man's axe and he chops this pole down, you see, and in the morning everybody wakes up and they find that um, the pole's been chopped down. Out of this, all the townspeople start getting angry and they find out finally, ultimately who he is. And then they challenge him to take it a step further. You know, maybe you are the one whom God would have us be led by to deliver us from the enemy of Midian. And so this is where the picture is here, a picture of uh, the next test that Gideon puts down before the Lord. Okay, so he didn't just work on assumption. Okay, God, uh, you know, you, you took that sacrifice. Now I'm, I'm in business and nothing's going to stop me. He stopped and he said, I'm going to test you. So he takes a fleece, a, fleece, a, a, a wool fleece, and he puts it on the ground and um, he asks the Lord to, make the dew that comes down uh, just land only on the fleece and not on the ground. So the ground's dry in the morning. He gets the fleece and he wrings it out. It's just laden full of water. And you think, oh, well, that's a pretty cool thing. Learned that the will of God is there. God's wanting him to take, uh, take on this leadership role. And he's like, no, let's do that again, but we'll do it the other way around. Okay, tomorrow what I want you to do, Lord, is make the dew everywhere and the fleece perfectly dry. So that's exactly what happens. And so Gideon raises up an army and he gets 10,000 men and they're going to take on the Midianites. They're all excited because they've finally got a hero. And that's what Israel needed. They needed a leader, someone they could trust. And what happened then is Gideon once again goes to the Lord. And the Lord tells him, you've now got too many people here for this army. And you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. I thought the whole idea of having an army is to have more than the other bloke. You know, so, you know, you can outnumber the enemy. And, and God says, no, look, you've got too many. Um, I'm not going to be glorified if you take this many men and march against the Midianites. So, what does Gideon do? Uh, he says, um, look, if any of you are really scared about going to battle, you can go home. So, like, okay. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've just gone and forgotten. Someone's going to tell me here. I don't know if it was a third or half of them went home. Um, but a whole lot of them went home. And then, God, and then Gideon's saying, Right, we're in business now. We've got all the brave ones. We're going to go and take on this, uh, Midi these Midianites. And God says, no, nah, too many. I'm not going to be glorified. And so here he is discerning the will of God, and he's realizing that God actually wants to glorify himself through the very first thing that Gideon offered, which was weakness. Weakness. 
And so he tries, this, he tries this. God says, take all the men down to the river and have them have a big drink. And he says, I want you to observe how the men are drinking. He said, there are those who will get down on all fours and drink like a dog. He says, I don't want those ones. I just want those who take the water out of the river and take the water up to their mouth with their hand. So Gideon quickly counts them, and he counts 300. So he's now left with 300 men. All the rest have been gone home, okay, sent home. And he ultimately attacks the Midianites, and uh, they have 300 shofars, horns, and, uh, and they smash these candles, uh, these jars with candles in them. And, uh, and when you do that, you've got to realize that they weren't just smashing a light. But in the jar itself, the jar was filled with oil. And so as soon as you smash it, the flame would then just go whoosh, right beside them, okay? So that's the picture we've got here. 300 encircled the camp. They smash the jars. Whoosh, all these lights go around. They blow on the shofar. Doo, 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 you know, whatever they do. And uh, God called, caused the uh, Midianites to just turn into an absolute panic. And the Israelites are on the outside of the camp and all the Midianites are killing each other, which is kind of helpful when you've only got 300 men. Okay, And so ultimately, God gets the victory. But the beautiful thing about this story, and I really encourage you to go to Judges 6 and 7 and read it, is that you just read how often Gideon inquired of God. See, the thing is that it's not about getting it right once, it's about getting it right every single time. It's about discerning the will of God and knowing what it is that you're called to at any given time so that you're not just assuming upon God. Okay, faith is not presumption. Okay, faith is not presumption. I remember seeing this really good foot rot flats cartoon many years ago. Uh, how many of you know what I'm saying when I say foot rot flats? Okay, yeah, some, of, some of you don't, but... Okay, the Foot Rot Flats is about a cartoon strip about a farmer and his dog, essentially. Anyway, Wall is a cricket player. And uh, this little cartoon shows um, Wall going out to play cricket. But it's hosing with rain. But what you see in each of the cartoon strips is that he's out there and he's banging in the wickets at the other end. He's erecting the scoreboard all the time. It's pouring with rain. Okay, And there he is in the final part of the cartoon, he's standing at the end of the cricket pitch, it's raining, no one's turned up, and this little bubble comes out of his head and it says, but God, I had faith. I had faith. No, he didn't. He had presumption. Why? If Wall had inquired of the Lord, the Lord would have said, don't worry about it today. Okay, it's not going to stop raining. Okay, so faith is about prayer and God leading, and God, God saying, and God calling, and God telling. Uh, faith is not about us just simply trying to muscle God into a position where he has to deliver to defend us in some way. Does that make sense? There's a huge, huge distinction, and we get ourselves in trouble quite often. Okay, so let's leave Gideon behind, but I really encourage you to go to Judges chapter 6 and 7 and just remind yourself of how God will take the least and turn them into the greatest by the discernment of his, of his will. And this is what I want to talk about now, discernment. The first thing that we've got to do when we're trying to discern the will of God is we've got to ask ourselves, what does the Bible say? God is not going to act or operate outside of his principles of Scripture. Okay? And I mean the whole Bible, the counsel of God, particularly these days, of course, we talk about the New Testament. Okay, you'll find that in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are a few distinctions that we have to get right. If you've got an enemy these days, you don't do what Gideon does. Okay? Often we're called to love our enemy. All right? We're called to forgive our enemy. But we need to operate with the understanding of the full counsel of God. And that's found within the scriptures. And that in itself is, is challenging because we often are faced with questions about life that the Bible doesn't talk about. Okay? So, you know, Lord, I need to have a new car. Shall I have a Subaru or a Toyota? I can get a chariot. I can get a chariot. And I'm serious about this. Because there are some communities 
Amish community, particularly in Pennsylvania and in America, because they can only find a chariot, they can only find a horse and cart, that's the will of God. Okay? But the simple truth is that there's going to be so much of what we do today that is not spoken about uh, in, in, the, um, in the scriptures. You know, shall I, shall I, get, an, shall I get apple? You know, or shall I get, um, tell, tell you now I'm Apple, don't you? Microsoft, you know, yeah. Or something generic, you know. Um, and, and these are all the things that we don't understand. And the challenge with that is that we, we need to understand the spirit of what God is about. You know, the Bible doesn't talk about many of the social problems that we face today. Uh, there's, there's no mention there about what we should do about nuclear disarmament. There's no mention there about genetic, genetic uh, modification of our food. You know, and so these things we're going to discuss and we're going to argue about. But we have to understand the will of God by pretty much asking ourselves the question, that good question, what would Jesus do? WWJD. Now, do you think Jesus would drive a Toyota or a Subaru? This is a huge debate. Okay? If you're a if you're a, um, a petrol head, you know, now, many of them would suggest he'll drive a Ford, but I, I don't know about that either. Yeah, I suppose he's got the miraculous powers of fixing it every time it breaks down, but that's probably why he'd be comfortable driving a Ford. Um, but the, the question is, the, th- the reality about our lives is that there is this big 95% of the things that we do that we don't even think about. You think about it. 95%, I would guess, of everything we do, we don't even think about. Okay, we breathe. Okay, we walk, we talk, we scratch, we blink. All of the things that our body does, all the things that we do in automatic, we don't even think about it. And the reason why is that we drive ourselves crazy. Imagine having to think about every action and every reflex. Maybe Breathe. Exhale. I wouldn't have much more time for anything else after that. Really, seriously. You know, and you just think about the things that you do unconsciously. But the problem with the unconscious is it reveals the conscious. The Bible says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, what does the Bible, sorry, what does your heart say or what does your mouth say when you slam your toe in the door? Okay? Or if you uh, find something's gone tragically wrong, Uh, or if you get a fright, the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. All of these things are about the will of God going on in your life because the will of God is being outworked from the inside out all the time. And how we continue to inform the inside will be basically uh, a result in 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 the biggest factor of how our lives are outworked in the will of God. You know, so... When I'm talking about discerning the will of God, the biggest challenge that we face is that so much of the will of God is going to be outworked unconsciously or subconsciously in your life. So it's the way that you treat the stranger. If the word of God has fed you about loving strangers, the word of God has fed you about kindness, okay, about generosity, about honoring somebody else, about treating somebody else better than yourself, that the servant shall be the greatest amongst you all. If the word of God has fed that, then your 95%, your subconscious, is going to manifest the will of God in any given situation. Does that make sense? And this is the hardest part about discerning the will of God. You know, I, 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 joke, I joke, but I don't. I was, you know, um, talking with some folks the other day, you know, about Christian education. And I said, look, it's, this is a reality for me. I know people with PhDs and doctorates in biblical studies who I would not want leading the Sunday school. Why? Because the 95% has not been convinced by Scripture about how to treat others, about how to respect others. Um, a couple of years ago, the, we had a guest speaker uh, in the life of our church here, and uh, I have to be careful here because there's probably not enough time has elapsed for this story. But this guy was from overseas, and we'd been uh, asked if we would like to host him. I said, yeah, that's fine. Um, Caleb, who's on our staff here, where has he gone? 
it's back there somewhere. Um, he jumped on a blog and found that this guy w had been writing about the churches that he'd visited whilst he was here in New Zealand. And he'd been absolutely scathing about all the churches that he'd visited. He talked about their signage, he talked about their music, he talked about their buildings, he talked about their location, he talked about their this, that and the other. And he came to me and he says, we've got this guy coming to speak. What's he going to say about us? Well, he didn't say anything, eh? Because we pointed out the fact that we were aware that he was writing this blog uh, about every other church and we challenged him with it and said, this is just entirely inappropriate. You cannot, just because you come from the other side of the world, uh, pretend to be our, our humble guest and then leave and write scathing comments about the church. And the comments were just petty. And so I looked at it and I thought, yeah, you've got a PhD. You might have been a lecturer. You might have written books. You might have a, a worldwide reputation. But the 95% isn't taken care of. The 95% will determine the other 5%. When you are trying to seek out the will of God for your future and the 95% is not being nurtured by this, then you're going to find yourself at odds with yourself. Because the, the, the biggest challenge that we all face in, in Christian ministry is not the opportunity, but it's the character to meet the opportunity that comes our way. Does that make sense? So um, it's, it's a little bit, dare I say it, use the, the music illustration again. It's the person with the beautiful voice or the wonderful skills who could enthrall us all with what they have. But then when you go and talk to them afterwards, it's just hollow and shallow because their skill is greater than their character. And so therefore, uh, there's a whole lot of work that is needed to do so that the character equals the skill and therefore the person is a complete package. You know, so if they're praising God and worshipping God and leading others in worship, and then you, you go and knock on the substance and find that it's hollow, it's just a very deflating time, isn't it? So that's why God calls us all to this challenge of, uh, of, uh, of discernment. And the last two things, of course, when you discern, bring discernment into your life, um, fellowship. You need to have other people around you speaking into your life. You need to, and you need to invite them. Even if it's difficult. Even if it's difficult to hear. A true friend will tell you the truth. You ever watch the, uh, the auditions for something like um, New Zealand Idol? And those people get up and they sing songs, and you go, how did they ever get to the position to be on public television singing like that? They're so convinced they're good. Their mother or their father or their brother or their sister or their school friend or their work colleague or their karaoke buddy or whatever they've been learning how to sing did not have the audacity to tell them the simple truth that you can't sing. So what does a person have to do? They have to appear on public television and absolutely humiliate themselves in front of a, a, a live audience and judges to be, abs to be told for the first time in their lives the truth. And I think, how sad is that? It's very entertaining, but it's very sad. It's very sad. And Christians shouldn't suffer from that. The word is that we should love our brothers and sisters enough to tell them the truth. The word is actually admonish. It's even to the point of correction. Okay? So we should know ourselves well enough because people in fellowship around us should be able to help us. I know for Michaela and I, before we went off to Bible college, um, we had people coming to us, talking to us and saying, you need to go into ministry. You need to consider this. You know, these are the things that we see in your life and if that was nurtured, that was strengthened with good education and good support, then, you know, there's every chance that, you know, God will have you in pastoral ministry. You know, that was a fellowship discernment. At the end of the day, the body of Christ sent us off to college. The body of Christ received us. If I send me off to college, only I can receive me. Does it make sense? Yeah. And finally, this is the most obvious thing to say, but prayer has to undergird, overgird, 
package up the sides, be poured into the middle of everything that you do. Because when, you come, when it comes down to it, God's going to open up doors, close doors, bring people into your lives that are just going to help steer the will of God into its perfect place for you. And don't ever be concerned about the challenges that you face in life because these are the best ways in which God will train you up. These are the best ways that God will show you how to make a, um, uh, show you how his will is going to be outworked. And Michaela and I went off to Baptist College and we applied and, um, in one particular year. And I was in the, the chapel on this weekend. I was on my own, the chapel at the college. And I was praying, Lord, you know, is this right for us to come? And cl- clearly, as I've heard anything before, God said, I don't want you to come this year. I want you to come next year. It's like, oh, okay. I had it all worked out. So I went back and I was working at the Inland Revenue Department. Okay, so that's punishment enough. And um, anyway, this guy rings me up and says, look, Craig, um, he said, I've been helping this guy with his business. It's in a real miserable way. And he ran a cleaning business, a commercial cleaning business. And he said, I'm looking for someone who can come in and manage this business and try to turn it around, otherwise it's going gonna, it's gonna to go broke. And I said, look, I've only got, this is about January, February, I said, I've only got a year until I head off to college. And um, he says, that's all it needs. He says, we just need you for, come in for a year and help, help us sort it out. So it wasn't difficult. I found that the, uh, the guy was paying his workers more than he was charging the client. Okay, so didn't need a PhD in business management to work out that if you do that, you'll end up going broke, okay? So it took us a little while and we got things sorted and uh, the business started to correct itself, everything going up to the right, which was good. And, um, and then God started to work on me because I was managing this business and we had numbers of staff doing jobs all over, over the city. And one of the jobs that we had was um, uh, to clean the public toilets down by the library in town. So I looked at the books and what was happening and I saw that there was a guy travelling all the way from uh, the race course out by uh, the end of the city, travelling in to do a 45-minute job and then travelling back. And we were paying him two hours worth of time to do a 45-minute job. And I thought, mm, that's not very clever. And God said, well, you're in town. You go clean the public toilets. It's like, but I'm the manager. No, you go clean the public toilets. Okay. So I put my white overall on, got my bucket and my toilet brush, and I'd walk downtown. And, uh, and in that moment, God would arrange for every person that I'd ever known in my whole life to be out on the street shopping. And I would wander past, hi, hi, hi. What are you doing, Craig? Just going to go clean the public toilets. Oh, really? And then another job we had was uh, the Farmers Trading Company. You know, with farmers is, same building. Um, they've got carpet on the floor, except they've got 800 metres of lino all the way around. Okay, so three times a week our guys would go in and buff the floors. What we knew at the time was that uh, when anybody ever scuffs the lino like this with their shoe, they have a black mark, right? The buffers can't take those off. You've got to take them off with steel wool. So I was watching these guys doing their jobs, and they just turn the machine off, get down on their hands and knees, get the steel wool, clean the black mark off, pick up the buffer again, and away they'd go. And they were doing this hundreds of times in a couple of hours. I thought, if I had somebody going around on their hands and knees, taking off those black marks, before the buffer, these guys could just scream down there. It'd be like poetry in motion. You know, and just the shiny floor behind, and we'd be out of here real quick. And God said, that's a great idea. I want you to do it. So, but I'm the manager. You do it. It's amazing how many people I would see that I knew (laughs) coming down the aisle. They would see me, think that they weren't seen by me, then I'd see their feet going around the aisle. Actually, Murray, you were working there at Farmers at the time (laughs) when God was giving me my lessons in humility. Yeah. It was with with, uh, uh, Jones family, the business, yeah. So these are the things that God was teaching me. But in the midst of this, um, we used to collect all the rubbish. And one day, um, we're throwing all this rubbish in a rubbish skip. 
and it was so full we couldn't get the week's rubbish in one of those big skip bins. So I jumped into the rubbish bin, and there I was, jumping up and down on the rubbish, trying to get more, you know, saving money, saving money. You know, and I was like, yeah, I'm the manager, but I'm also the, the biggest guy here, so I can get the rubbish down, you know, lower than anybody else. And um, anyway, out popped this green stone tiki. I thought, oh, that's interesting. I've got no idea where it came from. Could have been thrown in there, so I just threw it in the, in the vehicle. And um, didn't think anything of it. And a couple of months later, before we were going up to Auckland, I took it into a jeweler and I just said, look, there's this green stone ticky that I've got here. Do you guys want it? You can buy it off me for 50 bucks or something. You might want to chop it up and make some little pendants or something. And the guy goes, and he says, that could be old. He says, you want to take it to a museum and see what they think. And I said, well, I'm going to Auckland soon. And I said, I'll go and have a look. So I took it up. Makata and I went one day to the curator of the Auckland Museum and he gasped and he goes, this is really old. It's like, wow. I said, oh, well, somebody's lost this. So we got hold of the police and we gave it back to the police and they tried to find an owner and we left it with the police for about nine months. And, um, uh, <clears throat> and finally we got it back and um, we were told by the museum that we should put it in an auction down in Wellington. And so we did and we got $4,500 for it and it paid all of our university fees wow. for the time that we were there. And we, we'd gone in faith, we didn't have no idea how we were going to pay those fees. So therefore, even in the rubbish, we discern the will of God, okay? And God managed to manage my uh, ego with the public toilets of Taronga and the floors of farmers trading. But at the same time, jumping up and down in the rubbish skip, he also paid my bills. Isn't it amazing? It's amazing. So in the midst of it all, discerning the will of God, we need to know, I've lost it, we need to know, grander earth is quaked before, moved by the sound of the voice, seas that are shaken and stirred, can be calmed and broken for my regard. That sounds like a deep comment to finish with. It's actually a song we were going to sing. I was going to say the final slide is patience. Patience. Discerning the will of God, time is your friend. Don't be in a rush because God has got you exactly where he wants you to be and if he's working on your character, if you're cleaning those toilets, if you're cleaning those floors, if you're jumping up and down on the rubbish bins, doing all those things of a servant, he's got you exactly where you need to be and his will will be discerned by you. Let's stand up and I'll pray for us. Indeed, Lord, we, um, we know that you're the God of the personal touch. You're the God who takes us on a journey and allows us to explore and discover your perfect will. And I just want to pray for my friends here tonight that through your word they would be comforted to know that you're not the God who abandons people. You're the God who leans in towards us and whispers gently to us. And sometimes in the midst of the whispers, Lord, the wind is wild and storms around us the ground shakes, but that still small voice is what we're after. And so I thank you, Lord, that you're the God of circumstances. You're the God who ties all the loose ends together. But above all things, you're the God who can be trusted. And so we commit ourselves afresh to you, Lord. We, we turn up the palms of our hands to you. And we say, your will be done. Your will be done that we might be transformed in the image of your son, Jesus, and continue to know the blessing of his will in our lives. So we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.